Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Dolby Institute and Soundworks Collection uh, special edition podcast with a focus on the Oscars. And I'm thrilled to be here on the lot at Fox Studios in Los Angeles talking with the team uh, uh, on Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, welcome to the show, everyone. I'm going to start with my left uh, with the supervising sound editor, John Warhurst. Uh, and next to John is supervising dialogue and ADR editor, Nina Hartstone. Welcome. Thank you. Um, re-recording mixers Paul Massey and Tim Cabigan. Oh. Thank you. And then uh, last but not least, I should say first and certainly not least, uh, <laughs> production sound mixer John Casali. Hi. Welcome everybody to the show. And first of all, congratulations on uh, on this movie. First of all, it's just been a phenomenal commercial success at the box office worldwide. But everybody talks about the sound on this film. I think with good reason. You know, it's 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 obviously it's a music driven film. And I have a lot of questions about how you guys, about how you guys and 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 ladies did the uh, did the did the sound on the film. Um, but I thought we'd just I would love to just kind of dive in and let's talk about that that showcase the 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 live aid concert scene because I think if we kind of dig into that, it's probably going to answer a lot of questions about the process and how and how the the movie came together. So obviously, you know, you've got the challenge of of it kind of bookends the film. But it really is the last almost 15, 20 minutes of the film is this famous uh, Queen's Live Aid concert in, in Wembley uh, Stadium in, in 1985. So, you know, and it's stunningly, the, the, the concert is presented pretty, I mean, it's, it's, it's a shortened version of what actually happened. But the choreography, like there was, a, there was a tremendous amount of energy around trying to replicate that concert as quickly, as, as closely as possible. It's very clear from the visuals and stuff. So I want to find out about how you guys approach that from a sound standpoint. How did you, what was the, what's the base material that you had to work with? How did you build the tracks? And then, of course, how did the mix come together? Who wants to dive in? Um, so we started with, um, John showed me the proof of concept test shoot um, with Rami uh, singing uh, a Freddie track and it was amazing, it was amazing. And so he said that what we really needed to do was to record Freddie's vocals live. Um, because Meaning Rami singing? Yeah, right. yeah Rami yeah. singing, sorry. Um, but, um, and, uh, and he was going to use that in the mix with Freddie's vocals and Rami's and combine the two and uh, and that's what the um, proof of concept was and it was remarkable. It was and absolutely remarkable. Proof of concept, so this was something that they did in pre-production before they yeah. went out and shot the film? John, well, John can tell you about that. Um, yeah, I, I got involved with the film very early on um, uh, before they'd even sort of started shooting and uh, they, they had a script. I, they, I, got, I got a call to say that uh, they were definitely going to go and try and press ahead and shoot the film. Uh, they had the script, and he said, and uh, Dennis O'Sullivan and Graham King, they said, we've found our Freddie Mercury, and we've got a director, and I think we're going to green light it, we're going to shoot it uh, this year. So they gave me a copy of the script. I read through it, um, sort of working through, because I, I supervised the sound, but also the music edit as well. I see, okay. So, oh, so you did a lot of the heavy lifting on this film. Yeah. yeah. It, it, well, the, the, the starting point really was to, to read, and I'd read versions of the script before, because they, they'd, co they'd contacted me before in sort of 2014 with a different version of the film, with a different Freddie and a different director, which that, that one never, it never really took off. So the first thing was to sort of read through the script and just block out all the sections in the script how each scene was going to be done, um, how, how, how we'd sort of, you know, um, uh, move forward to shoot that scene. Um, so we went to Abbey Road Studios and spent some time working with Rami and uh, working with uh, sort of some of, the, some of the material that Queen had given to Because, again, that was another big question mark, was how, how involved were Queen going to be? That was quite essential. Uh, if they were going to be involved and in what material they had, so the first thing, I, I got invited to Brian and Roger's studio to, to have a listen through to all the multi-tracks, which obviously was... Well, that must have been a great day at work for you. That, that was... That was uh, I couldn't actually believe I was being paid as well. It was one of those sort of days. Uh, and so um, we, 
I had a long list of things that we were looking for. So we thought there's no there's no need to recreate anything in a studio if they already have the multi track of it. So I, I would go down and say things like we need we need a live version of Keep Yourself Alive, and they'd say okay, well they'd go to the archive and say we have 17 versions of that for, for over the years. Which one do you want? So then it became even more detailed than as to which one. So then we'd say which one have you already released and which one hasn't been released and which one. So let me ask you. So are they were they sort of like the Grateful Dead in that did they make just recordings of everything that they went out they and did. did they did and so you yeah. had access to all that material yeah e even even the the uh sort of recordings from 1974 which they did at the rainbow when they were when they were quite sort of you know in, in their younger days as a band they they even recorded all those on 16 track multi-track so we had we had a huge amount of material that we could really sort of tap into and their and their archive is 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 enormous obviously they've got uh, like as i say that it wasn't a question of do you have a live you know version of this it was like, which one we have multiple versions which one is, which one would work for you in the film so then we would listen through to them all and try and uh, sort of choose which one we wanted and then of course we had to put a list together of the ones that we wanted and then their engineers would have to go back to the band and say they think this one but what uh, which ones are you happy with because uh, they, they were very involved the band the band were really involved with the with the project um, so then we we had to sort of arc you know um, get together all the uh, material ready before the shoot even happened and that's when we put together the proof of concept that John mentioned um, and that that was to show to Fox um, to get a know, green light for the budget to, yeah to, to, to get the film <clears throat> green lit and to, to illustrate what how, how we'd shoot the film with Rami being Freddie Mercury that's great let's continue talking about the the live aid sequence so so such a famous concert but did you have were there multi-track recordings from the concert or what did you have access to to start that to build was that? the bit that was the big question because we thought uh, maybe that's the one that they don't have because uh people weren't that you they weren't meant to record that uh, concert and obviously it was a it was a broadcast to tv so we knew that that in terms of the images they only had sort of broadcast quality um images um, and and they probably did they broadcast the concert in stereo in '85? So yes, exactly. We, so you knew that there was a stereo mix. There, down. there was definitely a stereo <clears throat> mix. There was one on YouTube. There was a, a stereo mix. That, you know, um, of, of it existed on YouTube. So we knew there was that. But then they said that they did have a multi-track of um, of Live Aid because uh, yeah. he he was told to not record it. And, but he thought it was criminal to let this performance go ahead. And he had a multi-track in his sort of uh, BBC, uh, you know, outside broadcasting truck. And he decided to run a multi-track of the, of the whole day. So he saved the day. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> this whole <laughs> movie. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I hope you guys gave him a special thanks in the credits. We did. We <laughs> did, yes. <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. So what was the separation on that multi-track from the, from the Live Aid concert? Do you guys remember? Like how, what's... I mean, there were only four band members, so it must have been four microphones, or what did you have access to? Do you want to do well, that, Paul? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we had, all the way through the film, including the Live Aid sequence, we had um, access, as John's described, to all of these wonderful archived uh, multi-tracks for every single song they've ever done. And especially during the Live Aid, I mean, we had, obviously, multiple mics on the drum kit, um, bass, guitar, Vocal mics uh, for Freddie at at his keyboard position, and also his uh, walking around the stage handheld. Um, and we had audience um, pretty much in stereo as well uh, on on that same multi track. So we had we had everything we needed: keyboards, the, the piano, everything was individual. Uh, and Jeff from you know BBC just saved the day by recording that. That's amazing. We weren't really able to use much of the audience miking because. Um, you know, it was very limited in its, you could hear there was audience there, but it was very limited in its immediacy and it didn't really translate well into what we needed to do for, you know, a 2018 release in Dolby Atmos. Well, I wanted to ask you that because, I mean, it's fantastic that you had multi-tracks in the 85 concert, but, you know, I, I, my, I'm guessing that they were probably miking it primarily for a, for a broadcast and not necessarily for a 2018 release in Dolby Atmos, which obviously didn't exist at the time. <laughs> Correct. So, were those were, was that multi-track clean enough for you, or what, how did what did you do with it to sort of? Well, in the process, because the the film sounds just fantastic and present, and it's a gorgeous mix, especially on that last sequence. Yeah, great. Um, in the process of of archiving all of this material. Um, Brian and Roger have uh, three engineers that they rely on uh, to do their archiving and, and to keep their library up to date. Um, and they had 
um, they had put together from the original multi-tracks. They'd done transfers to digital, to Pro Tools. Um, and then they had also gone through and preserved the original tracks, the instrumentation being separate. But they'd done applicable gating to the drums and such um, to, to make it ready for a mix for a live performance. Um, and, and balances, you know, roughly between the instrumentation. But so, so they had done a lot of that prep work for us. Uh, and when it was handed to, uh, to me to mix, in, um, we did a music pre-dub uh, section at Twickenham Studios um, where I could just essentially assemble all of those tracks, try to regain that iconic Queen sound. That was a big challenge. And, and then also move the audience around the stage and around the stadium according to the shot in the film. Mm -hmm. We really wanted to get the feeling that when you're on stage and you're next to Roger's drum kit, you're really hearing his drum kit loud and proud above the remaining mix. So every single shot, we worked hard to get the perspectives on what was in the shot at the time, um, including once we went very, very wide on the on the stadium. You know, we, we used very ambient, um, an ambient sound on the music and um, etc. Talk to me a little bit about how do you how do you build an audience for a hundred thousand crowd sequence in Wembley? <clears throat> that was uh, that was actually we we had a moment. There was a on the uh, there was a second unit shoot day when the the cast had all finished uh, filming the sort of live aid. And they, they wanted to just do crowd shots, specific crowd shots. So they had a crane sort of going in and, and filming pockets of crowd. We saw that there was these 600 people showing up for this day. And uh, myself and John, um, we went to speak to the line producer and said, we have to record this crowd. We've got to record the singing. Because uh, from experience of other films, I know that even if, even if they'd have mic'd up the audience in a really great way, once you push up those audience mic, all you actually get is the slap of the PA. Mm -hmm. And once you start pushing them up, they, it just distorts the music more and more until, until you end up with, with a, a, a sort of a cacophonous mess, really, when, when you really push hard on those audience mics, because you just get more and more... Uh, sort of reverb of the PA. They're almost like room mics to, to what's happening on stage. Yeah. Um, so it was essential we had clean, clean audience that didn't have any music on at all. Um, the line producer agreed to it as long as we did it um, sort of between camera setups because they had a huge sort of schedule they wanted to try and get through on that day as well. And they said you can do it, on, but only between camera setups. Uh, and, and the ca I mean, but the crew's not necessarily quiet as a mouse while you no, guys are trying to no they because, but the challenge for you obviously was like this was not just kind of crowds you know doing walla or making noise but they're singing right they're singing along to the songs yeah and that, and th that was the other issue is, is well, how can we record these 600 people without any music because we can't give out 600 sets of headphones for them all to wear while we record the music um, and it was slightly inspired by Freddie's, uh, in the middle of Live Aid, he does this section, it's called the Deo section, where right. he sings out to the audience. And kind, the of audience call, uh, kind of a call and response. Call and, response. and we just thought, well, what, cause, because the, when, when we shot Live Aid, there was a full PA there uh, playing music out to the audience. So we thought what we could do is play them a line of, of the song and they could sing that back to us. Uh, sing back the line that they've just heard. So they're going to get roughly the right pitch and roughly the right rhythm mm -hmm. um, for each line. If we do it line by line. So we went through. I see. It, and, and every time they did a camera setup, we'd do another song. We'd do a, a, another song with them. So it's something like Radio Gaga. We'd play one. We created these Pro Tools sessions that looked sort of like barcode, where it would literally be chopped line by line. But the gap in between the session would have just enough space for them to sing back in time before the next line comes out the PA. So so it would be all you all we hear is Radio Gaga and they would sing that back to back, us. Right. And then it would be all we hear is radio it took a few times to get that right. They, they always wanted to sing the next line and I had to keep explaining to them, <laughs> no, you don't <laughs> sing the next line. You sing the line that you've just heard. <laughs> and so then we ended up with these uh, recordings uh, that obviously were all line by line. We managed to get about three passes with this 600 crowd uh, of each song, of all the verses, all the all the choruses for every song. And um, and then in, in the edit room, we could just sort of concertina these uh, back up to and fit them in time with the track again. So we, we had these um, sort of three three different passes of these 600 crowd. That And that was our sort of base crowd. We, we, we always discussed it with uh, Nina as, as it, it, to, to be able to get around the stadium, 
we really needed sort of three layers of crowd. We needed this sort of base layer crowd, which would make up the 90, 100,000 people, mm -hmm. which would always be present in the, in the, in the stadium. But then uh, we'd need like a medium layer crowd, a medium sized crowd. Uh, and then we'd need all the individuals and the specifics, the shout outs and things like that. So, um, so the, the, these, multi-tracked 600 crowd made the base layer the the hundred thousand and then nina did the the medium layer um, yeah so i did the it was basically our loop group sessions so we got we were uh, i knew we wanted to record but get about 40 people to get a bit of variety of voices but we did them in, in groups of eight and i didn't want to do it in an adr stage because i wanted it to, it to have that exterior feel uh, yeah, and i wanted to put energy. lots of mics on it mm -hmm. so we shot it at shepparton studios on a weekend so it was quiet and we had some of their ex exterior space, which is near their studio. So they were wheeling out headphones and a big monitor. And, you know, we, we mic'd it up with like an LCR at the front and we had a guy on a boom. So we got a bit of movement um, and then another three mics at the back. And then we did a very distant one as well. And we just sort of had them in, in groups of eight uh, listening to the song. And I was just G'ing them up the whole time, making sure they were <laughs> putting enough energy into it. You know, so they, they felt like the Live Aid crowd. You see them in the in the show they're like jumping at certain parts and those kind of things so i was just making sure that they they did that because you can you can hear it on their voice you know oh yeah so again multiple passes with all the different actors uh doing that and all, and we did some sort of song by song and little chunks where we wanted to get certain stuff and then i did a couple of passes of the whole thing so that by the time they get to champions they sound like that raw crowd who've been singing along with something for a while. I got to tell you, by the time you get to We Are the Champions, that is so satisfying. Like, that's just like everything comes together, and it's just, it's really, it's, you know, I, I, the first time I saw the film was up in San Francisco at the Dolby um, Cinema and Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos, and it, it just was, it was really emotional by the time you get to that point in the film. Yeah. yeah. We, we tried to put that journey in, didn't we? we, we did. uh, yeah. Yeah, no, we, the, trying to get the arc of Live Aid. There's, there's four songs in Live Aid in the film that are edited back, obviously. Um, and trying to get the arc of capturing the attention of the crowd essentially at the beginning and then feeling that the crowd is more and more with Queen throughout that sequence. Right. And the emotion of, of finally getting to We Are The Champions for both Freddie's life, the band themselves together as a unit and, and for the stadium to be collectively involved. That took a long time for us within the music mix, within the crowd mix and just the overall energy of how we wanted to portray that sequence. Um, Took many weeks, actually. Yeah. Back and forth. How long was the mix on the film? I think we had five weeks. Is that right? Including pre dubs. Is that right? Uh, no, Seven. eight weeks. Didn't oh, including pre week, including pre dubs. We did two weeks of pre dubs, didn't we? And then we had about six weeks on the final, did we? Including mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Did you guys temp at all, or was it? Uh, you, you, you did some temp mixes to go out for some audience previews. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was all it took him yeah. earlier on in the year. Um, yes. Yeah, we managed to get about four weeks into three weeks, didn't we? It was meant to be a three week final, final mix. Uh, and there was about three weeks of pre mixing. You started at yeah. Twickenham. Did you stay there the whole time or did you? Yeah. Yes, I, I did my. Um, Nina prepared the dialogue in ADR and group sessions and sent them to me in LA. And I, I did the pre mixes for those um, at my studio. And then. Um, then I went and joined the whole crew in, at Twickenham and we did everything else from there. Yeah. So, um, John, you had mentioned earlier that the original, the original test concept was that the, the vocals were going to be yeah. a mixture of uh, Freddie's original vocals with Rami. Is that, mm -hmm. is that kind of what ended up happening? Or I understand the question of what we're hearing is a little bit more complicated than I than might have been. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a mix of herbs and spices. I mean, the guys, <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll tell you the, the, the magic they worked on it because I completely bought into the test. I was, because to, to sell it, um, Rami had to sing. He had to sing to, so you could, you know, see his veins popping and otherwise it just wouldn't have been believable. Right. So he had to do that. But, you know, you've got to remember these guys aren't natural singers, you know, it's, it's, being on a stage in front of, you know, we had 600 crowd isn't natural for them. So we, we had to we we had to give them playback level as if they were at Live Aid. Mm -hmm. So we had a full line array for the crowd and we had monitors a go-go, but period monitors on the uh, on set. So they were so getting blasted like they, they were, were really blasted, And they performing. were asking for their own mixes, you know, they, cause Ben wanted his mix and 
which was great, but they, for them to perform and not feel self-conscious, because, and this was day one of the shoot. You guys, live you guys started with the Live Aid. We started with Live Aid. That's insane. So we hit the ground running for, in t- for the cast anyway. Um, and so it, it, you know, it had to be completely immersive for the cast. Otherwise, it would have been you know, very difficult. And they were amazing. They absolutely got it. Um, and it was, it was great. You know, it was great to see it. It really was. Um, and it was, we had a lot of fun, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a lot of fun. <clears throat> Obviously, with it being the first, the first thing that we shot, yeah. uh, it was. I mean, it was a full scale Live Aid set. And because that Wembley doesn't exist like that anymore. No, no, right? no. no. no, no. So, so it was built on a runway uh, on a on a small um, airfield on like an airstrip just outside of London, and it was in the middle of this runway that uh, they built the full Live Aid. They recreated completely. So how? So they basically they rebuilt the stage. Yeah. And probably that that, that kind of pit where the, yeah, the, the press height. the it press the guys are. It was the yeah. height of the stage. <clears throat> Exactly to recreate the pit, so the um, uh, so the press were there, and then the crowd were below that. Um, so some of those six hundred people that you had yeah. were yeah. right there at the absolutely. Lip of the, okay. and yeah, so he yeah. was. They were performing to a to a crowd, um, so they weren't performing to nothing at all. And and you know we we tried to get some crowd effects with the with the crowd there, but they were brilliant, weren't they? Because it was it felt so immersive. The crowd bought into it completely, didn't they? Yeah. Even though it was September and freezing cold, and they were in tight little shorts and t-shirts they were amazing yeah, yeah, yeah. And i think that helped the, that really helped the the band you know the the, the cast yeah. because we, they really got into it didn't well, they the, the because the, you know there was the, the 600 crowd we also used that for the effects crowd as well a lot of that was the kind of the mid the mid layer of the uh, the effects crowd that we we used them as well so all the crowd effects we managed to get from them as well didn't we the yeah, so record on takes on uh, so they'd tracks. stop them they would get them to continue singing whenever we could at all the concerts you know, every opportunity, every opportunity we could, we'd try and just get some more crowd effects because we thought, well, you know, everything's going to be useful. Sure. So the more the more tracks you've got, the better it is. And we just went every opportunity. I mean, I know you did you know, the crowd effects were amazing um, and there were lots of different sessions. But the more we got, we just felt we were never going to have too many. No, no. <laughs> uh, no. And you used a lot, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. The track count was insane, um, wasn't it? I, th- I think that 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 was the, the the sort of thing that was was the uh, when we when we did first start filming. I mean, I, everybody on that set was petrified that first day. Mm. I remember thinking everybody was nervous. Well, the stakes uh, were pretty high, right? Well, exa- exactly. And uh, I remember thinking we, we we were all yeah quite nervous. I remember thinking yeah if if I feel this nervous, I mean, how does Rami feel right mm. now? He's going to go out on stage yeah. and become Freddie Mercury. But the the thing with um, uh, Rami, he had to sing out. We, we knew from the proof of concept uh, reel that we put together that it was so important that he didn't mime. He didn't. He didn't. We kept saying to him, you know, you can't goldfish your way through this. You know, literally just just lip slapping right. your mouth around yeah. to to the lyrics. He had to really sort of force out uh, the vocal. Um, that's so. So by really lifting. Also, we had to have quite a lot of sound on on stage as well because uh, Ben, who was playing the drums. There was all these sort of great production ideas at first about how the symbols could be um, like a rubbery plastic, like fake symbols. Interesting, right? But they just they just look terrible. They mm. don't shimmer. They don't do anything. So then we realized we were going to have to switch them all out, and it was just going to have to play a real drum kit. So obviously, as soon as you start playing a real drum kit, you need the whole level of music to go up quite high to get over the top of that drum kit that he was playing. Um, and that um, Ben, he 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 just started sort of drum coaching um, a bit before that. He'd uh, he'd really? <laughs> done like two months of drum lessons, That's and was amazing. was uh, yeah he was playing every day. But that that really um, yeah the, the whole level of uh, yeah sound on set was was pretty intense, wasn't it? Pretty intense. Yeah. yeah. Roger also gave Ben a, a a quick lesson. I'm told. Oh man, I wish <laughs> which I must have been great. I hope they shot some video for yeah. when, when that happened. So Paul, can you unpack the the Freddie Mercury vocal a little bit and tell us? So we so there are yeah. several elements to it, right? Yeah. So we had three sources for Freddie's voice. Um, Obviously, Freddie from the live recordings. Um, we had Rami singing and um, doing all of the, the work that was just described. And then we also had um, uh, a guy named Mark Martel, who's from the Queen Extravaganza uh, tribute band. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he sounds pretty close to He Freddie, sounds very imagine. close to, to Freddie's original voice, yeah. So the majority of the film, obviously, is Freddie. He's the front man. It's, it's a story about him, and it's his band. 
Um, but there were sequences within the dramatic scenes of the film uh, where we simply didn't have the recordings of Freddie, um, such as when he's, you know, improvising "Happy Birthday" at the piano. Yeah, I had questions so, that yeah, that and some maybe some of the really early stuff, so, mm-hmm. which you know, it just sounds like it just sounds so much like you would expect Freddie to sound like. Yeah, right. And and again, you know, hats off to to Rami, his performance. He took on Freddie Mercury. It's so so bravely and so well um, that it, it was um, I won't say easy but it was it was doable to make him uh, appear as he was uh, singing his Freddie's voice when when it wasn't actually him that we were using and then um, well I think it's a credit to both Rami but also to you this this team that you know it's definitely not like a West Side Story kind of thing where like the dramatic scene stops and then the actor opens the mouth and then a completely different voice comes out for the singing portion of the of the performance. It really it really feels like it's just one cohesive performance. And my hats off too to to Nina and John Waters for um, for doing all of that editing and working with John Ottman very closely so we could roll sync on picture shots and such. Uh, Nina went to great lengths to find even when we weren't using Rami's voice to find his syllables and, and such that had been shot on the day so that a lot of John Casale's uh, production material was utilized. And um, we essentially used a combination of those three voices all the way through the film and, uh, and we'll never let on where we actually made those edits. <laughs> the, the, other, the other thing that worked well was uh, when, when we talked about doing those scenes, uh, about how they could be created, things like when he's writing Love of My Life in the studio, um, we talked about how, uh, w- whether that would be a sort of playback music, we, we would actually play back to Rami that, and he would try and lip sync that playback, or, or how we were going to create it. And we decided that ultimately... Uh, the the best thing to do would be to let Rami almost perform it because sure. the, the the piano was it was a mute piano so <clears throat> so he had to learn sort of roughly the piano part and um, did so, Rami play piano before this movie or did no 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 he had a okay. lot of piano coaching as well to try and get his piano because yeah, you got some nice close ups on him especially when he's playing the, the beginning of Bohemian Rhapsody and all that stuff yeah yeah when yeah. he's doing it upside down yeah right? that's yeah. all him as well that's all <clears throat> him yeah. yeah. Uh, and and um, so rather than doing this sort of playback musical way, we, we decided to let him actually just perform as an actor mm-hmm. and to sort of feel out the scene. You know, because a lot of actors, want, you know, they, they don't know quite how they want to do it until they're actually sat on the set and then get a feel for, for, um, for, for, the, for the moment and just perform it that way. And then so he performed um, those scenes himself. And then what we did was we took away, uh, I, I remember asking John to put a, a microphone underneath the piano. So all we actually had was the sound of the sort of thumping of, uh, of the piano, the sort of thumping and clumping sound. And, uh, and Rami's vocal, because mm-hmm. Rami, he, you know, he was, he was a good singer, he could sing, sure. but obviously he, couldn't, he didn't have a four octave range and sound <laughs> like Freddie Mercury. Uh, uh, so. He also had a certain dental apparatus that he was having to work yeah. around, right? Yeah. Did that, yeah. Ca- did that create yeah. a lot of ADR issues? Uh, no, no, he'd got so used to them. I mean, I, I think he was wearing them for a long time before he even came on set. It's, it's really quite a small piece he had it in ADR so they were always lying around on <laughs> you, had bring, you had to bring it back for the ADR sessions of course <laughs> yeah, of course. yeah. Um, but it is it was a really small piece that he had in there and um, you know so I couldn't always tell whether he had them in or not I'm really like have you got them in <laughs> so yeah I shot a couple of times with them out by accident and I couldn't tell the difference no. with them in or out because huh. he was really he got so used to wearing them yeah, didn't he? he just kept them in didn't he you mentioned John Ottman, who was the picture editor on the film, and <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about his involvement because uh, he also typically is a is a music composer as well, uh, in addition to cutting picture. So what you know, what was the discussion about score for this film? Um, I think John had a lot of um, pressure to try to come up with the score for the film in the early days as he was assembling the cut. Um, and he, um, he made a great decision to ultimately say pretty much no score whatsoever through the film and instead use, utilize the, um, the, the songs that Freddie used to listen to at home, um, those being very, very opera-based, and also to underscore with Queen music, um, whether it's sourced on a TV, um, like The Love of My Life sequence uh, with Lucy, um, or... 
or however else it was presented throughout the film, he just felt that it was contrary to to what they were trying to make as a queen based music film. Um, and I think so it was it proved score coming on top. Yeah, to be a, a regular orchestral score. Uh, and to his credit, I think uh, it was a very brave decision and, and one that ultimately worked very well for the film in the service of the film. One of my favorite sequences in the film, I mean, you know, I think when people think about the sound for the film, they obviously gravitate towards, you know, the the production numbers and the, the, the concerts. Uh, but one of my favorite scenes in the film from a sound perspective was the press conference. Um, and Tim, I would love to hear you kind of unpack that sequence and talk a little bit about it because it's really, it became very impressionistic. Yeah, I think... Um... The whole idea of that sequence was obviously to show the pressure that was Freddie Freddie was under, and that basically how things had got out of control in his life. Um, and so John, the picture editor, had a pretty strong idea of what he wanted. To be fair, so basically our job was just to use all the sound design that our circuit had, had sort of built up, and was to start the the scene off quite gently. Paul had done the dialogues, and basically there's quite a bit of work with the dialogue, with the reverbs, and, and that bouncing around the room. And we just had to fill in the gaps with the, the flashes going off using the Atmos. And so basically, you were trying to make the audience feel a little bit discombobulated as sure. well as everything's going off. And it was um, the idea was kind of like have a, a pressure cooker thing where it was just slowly, slowly building and building and building and building until that very last kind of scene where it just, yeah. it, it just he snaps out of it. And so it took a fair time to do that because obviously John, the picture editor, he had... Uh, he had in his mind how he wanted it to doing. So we came up with a whole load of different ideas, but um, it was uh, it was interesting and it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> what were, from an, an effect standpoint, what are some of the elements in that in that sequence? And uh, Andy, Andy Kennedy did a lot of work on it. A guy called Andy Kennedy, and and he used a lot of uh, he got he had a, like a lot of cameras uh, that he went and recorded he, from like period cameras because he wanted the, all the sort of flashes. John started off with a with a with a fairly clear idea of what he wanted it to be. He'd already laid up a lot of things in the Avid, so we sort of took that as a as a starting point. And um, and then um, Andy Kennedy did a pass on it, and Al Circuit did a pass on it, and and then we sort of built up all these different layers of um, uh, sort of sound design on top on top of what John already had. Yeah. Well, to me, you know, I talk a lot about sound design, especially to writers and directors and people who don't normally think about sound design, and I love that sequence because to me, it illustrates one of the great powerful uses of sound, which is to get inside the head of your character, um, and even though it's certainly not meant to be literal in any because yeah. it's the if you pick if you think about the, that track it's pretty over the top in terms yeah. of yeah. the treatment of the sound <clears throat> but it, it really communicates that that tension and what's going on for freddie at that moment that was the idea yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, it, it took a long time i think for us all collectively to to work that arc again we talked about the arc of, of live aid but within the within the press sequence um, because there is no music really in that sequence. It's all right. dialogue, reverbs, you know, and um, delays, and uh, and using the room with sound effects and literally voice. I mean, normally you use music to create tension a lot of the time, and we we didn't rely on that at all. There is no. I think there's a, a tone that runs underneath. It's, there's one piece of score it. underneath that. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. A, tone, tone a piece a piece under it, didn't it? Just a tone. But uh, I remember I remember we mixed that for a very long time, and there was very very long time when it was never quite right hmm. and and it Cheers. seemed it, <laughs> <laughs> no, no 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 but, 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 what, but what i'm saying <laughs> no, what, what i'm saying is that is that that we we it took a lot of mixing we mixed it and mixed it and mixed it and and, and it was never quite never quite right never quite right. and then only towards the end that we said okay it is you know it just took a lot of work it took a lot of work to find the shape to be to be apps to get it absolutely right to get the the sort of the emotional arc out of it that you wanted it to be uh, that, that it had to be this sort of pressure cookie building up and not build up too quickly um, well you know, especially when as you say you're not using score yeah to communicate yeah. that which is which is the tool that most people pick up and when it's they actually when they quite work. a long scene as well isn't it yeah, that's, that's fair yeah, to say yeah. though isn't it tim i mean you you know you you spent a lot of work on that you did a lot of a lot yeah of, yeah, uh, yeah i mean as you say it took forever <laughs> 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 Yeah, because yeah, you didn't have you d you didn't have that sort of fallback area. Okay, push the music to sort of create the tension. Yeah, it was you know it was it was literally camera clicks, voice, flashes going off, reverbs and delay. That that was 
that was it, you know. And again, whenever we chose to to create that ultimate peak where, where Freddy just completely loses it and we cut to the next scene, um, anytime we created that, that build, whether it be toward the end of the scene or whether it start too early, earlier on, we had to then go back to almost the beginning of the scene and play it all the way through again just to say, does this even work? Mm-hmm. In the moment, of course, it feels like it works. And then you watch the scene back and you go, eh, we're, we're like... 10 seconds too early we're starting that build mm-hmm. too early Freddie hasn't see. recognized it yet right. um, and so you know it, it took a lot of trial and error to get yeah. that scene to work but obviously the way that the, the scene is shot gave you guys a lot of opportunities as well because yeah. <clears throat> it's the, the image is distorted a lot of clo- like extreme close ups and that, that gives you a lot of license to then go very impressionistic with the sound yeah yes, it did right. yeah it was Tom, Tom Siegel um, doing some he did a lot of experimentation didn't he on that day with, with sort of different lenses and different shots to, to get a huge amount of material for John to be able to sort of work it edit it all together yeah um, but yeah some of those shots they'd lend themselves towards um, sort of sound design moments yeah uh, I want to talk about, a little bit about um, and I, I'm probably not going to f- phrase this exactly well but it, I want to talk about emotion in the dialogue and I'm thinking about, you know, the, you probably you had some very beautiful locations on the film that I, I presume probably posed some challenges from a sound recording standpoint. But I'm thinking specifically about um, they're rehearsing for the Live Aid concert and they're in a, it looks like a church. Where, where the, or was that Abbey, was it, Abbey it's Abbey Road? No, it's, oh, no, it wasn't. No, it's no, Air Studios. Air Studios, that's yeah. right in Hampstead. Yeah. yeah, Air Studios. And the 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 treatment of the dialogue. This is uh, you know obviously they're they're struggling with the rehearsals and they kind of call it a day and then Freddie uses that moment to disclose the band that he has AIDS. Um, and again, no music in that, but it's a really emotional sequence. And I, I I wanted to hear from the from the two of you how you handled the dialogue in that sequence because it's not it's 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 played in a what sounds to my ear in a really interesting fashion. It, it was very well recorded, John. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, obviously, um, very, very well performed. You know, the, the, the scene that always makes me cry. Um, uh, so it was just, it, it didn't need an, too much doing to it in terms of dialogue editing, to be honest with you, because it was, it was nicely done. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, any little breath and stuff or anything that, that just you want to hear peeking through was there. Um but yeah, and it had some natural reverb on it, didn't mm. it, from the recording because of because obviously the location. In that location, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, it was it was actually not one of the harder scenes I feel dialogue wise. No, I mean I think in the mix we we, we concentrated as as Nina said there was some natural reverb on uh, the performance, which posed its challenges because it starts off in a lot of wide shots and then closing down the um, the rehearsal and then discussing wh- where they were going to go next while Freddie is contemplating telling the band um, what is happening to him. And and then as we cut to, um, f- so in the earlier section, I had to uh, enhance the reverb a little bit for the wide shots and try to overstate that somewhat so that we could have a contrast as the f- scene flowed again um, right. and as we got, as the camera pushed in more on Freddie, as he told the story he was about to tell to the band, um, try to make that as dry as possible and as very upfront, um, accentuated consonants and such, so it becomes very intimate. Mm-hmm. Because he didn't want to tell anyone else uh, within that scene. He wanted to just tell. It was the just band. for the. It was just for yeah. the four of them. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So uh, that was really the approach we took, um, and it was really well recorded. John, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Honestly, they're never normally this nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We can do this again. <laughs> yeah, you, you, usually the production sound mixer is the uh, is the, the you know boy. the whipping boy. Uh, yeah. By the time this, you get to the mixing awesome. stage, honestly, right. we can do this again any day. <laughs> talk to me a little bit about the. You made a mention, but talk to me a little bit about the band and their their involvement with how the music was presented in the film. Did they come to the mixing stage and hear things, or like how what, what how did that how did that go? They did. Um, yeah, John, do you want to start off with? I mean, you worked with the band early on before uh, I was involved. They, they, they were very heavily involved. They were, as, as I was saying, even down to the choice of the tracks that they wanted us to use um, in the film to start with. You know, it, it, tracks that hadn't been released or the ones that had been released. So they were, they, they were you know, um, sort of approving all, all of those things. But 
Um, they they also, I mean, they, they came to the edit as well. They wanted to hear how the songs had been edited down. We had quite a few <laughs> meetings with them about, uh, yeah, discussing, you know, way, different ways. that Because, you know, as, as you probably know, with, with studio pictures, there's always that pressure of time. They always want time taking out. And, and so there wasn't time to play all the songs in, in full. And um, see, there, there were many discussions about how they were, how they were to be cut or edited down. Um, and, uh, but then later on as well, they, they have sort of three, three engineers, uh, Justin Shirley Smith, uh, Josh McRae and Chris Fredrickson, who, uh, who were on hand all the time and they came to the mix. They, they were in the in the final mix with us sort of full time. And then on days where their schedule, where the band schedule allowed, then uh, Brian and Roger would come down and sort of, and you know, listen, listen through things as well. But we always had, we always had uh, Justin and Josh and Chris to be able to say, you know, do you think Brian will be happy with this or would they like this? Oh, or, so they were kind of the first ears. To the sounding of, board, yeah. yes, yeah. For, for, for the band. They had the trusted years from the band. So it yeah. sounds like they were involved, but you literally couldn't have made this movie without their involvement, right? Because it, they gave you access to all this original material. Exactly. Well, well, well going going all the way back to the beginning again, when, when we first started talking, the, having the discussions about how the film could be made, it would it would have been a very, very different film if, if they hadn't have been involved, or if they hadn't said, you know, you, you can use these, multi, we have all these multi-tracks and you can use them all. And we'd have had to have gone out, say, with, you know, with a lot of musical films that get made, you actually start with nothing and, right. and, and build all those tracks up and get musicians in uh, and recreate uh, and, right. and recreate all of those things and recreate live aid and uh and and you know that's obviously a huge amount of work so there, there were all kinds of costings and budgets that were being prepared to to see how how that could be done the time frame so once once they got involved with uh, with all their archive that it, it did change the course of the film the kind of film that we could make well i think i think this answers my my next question but i, I really you know I, one of my favorite sequences is the you know the the recording sequence for Bohemian Rhapsody when they're all out at the farmhouse, and I, I I'm you know I was going to ask you like well how did you but it sounds like probably you built that because you had access to the original multi track masters right well we actually went even one step further than having the original multi track masters because uh, we sort of said to them now they're in a studio they're creating this song so if we play back the perfect 1975 track every single time it doesn't actually show the journey it doesn't of show them. the progression or their evolution of or their false starts and how they messed up and sure exactly yeah. and when and when brian plays the guitar solo and then freddie says put your body into it put your put your heart if if that was the guitar solo from the single it wouldn't make sense because right. he already just played the perfect guitar solo so uh there, there was there was two different things that that guitar the first guitar solo brian actually replayed as a new guitar solo that was kind of like the original but meant to be not quite there yet uh, oh well of course so you have access to brian may he yeah, can come so back he can actually he can just come back and record a new version of yeah it, right? exactly right. He, yeah uh he could and not not only did he uh play as a new guitar solo but he took some of the dialogue and when when Brian lifts his guitar up and speaks uh, into his pickup, to, to, so it comes out of, the, uh, of his, his amp and back to the control room, he actually recorded that, that line, those lines of dialogue through his guitar amp uh, wow. and, and sent us back the lines. But then uh, also the, the, he, their engineers went back to, the, um, back to the archive and they actually dug out all the original recordings from Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, so the original recording sessions. So the ones the that takes tapes. that never even made it onto the single. Wow. So so we we were given all these various takes of vocal takes and things like that that never actually got to the single, uh, you know, the, the 1975 single that we all know. And they gave us uh, all kinds of bits and pieces of vocals, which is what we also used sure. throughout that scene to, to, to sort of build up all the Galileos and things like that. They, right. they, they were all added on. Some, some outtakes of Freddie's main vocal as well. There's, there's, um, when, uh, when Rami's playing the, the piano in the farmhouse, mm -hmm. uh, that we used some of, um, some of the outtakes of Freddie's vocals that never actually made it to the single. So that's not the, the, the single vocal that you hear there. That's, those are outtakes. So they, they gave us all of these things, yeah. That sequence in the, the Bohemian Rhapsody in the studio, the recording of it all, um, obviously once, once John had prepared all these tracks, as you just described, then taking that, I wanted it to be very, very real, hyper-real as to the rawness of the guitar amp when the camera is right in front of him, sure. in front of it, in front of it, and the sound of the control room monitors, 
And because it's very different. If, yeah. you know, if you've ever been in a recording exactly. studio, yeah. if you're standing next to the artist, it sounds very different than it does in the control room. Exactly. Yeah. So that sequence, I mean, my background was in music engineering when I first started, and I <laughs> happened to start back in the days when it was all 24 track recording. And so I really wanted to hyper, hyper um, accentuate yeah. the leakage from the headphones while they're singing vocals, for instance. Um, and John was able to take the track to Abbey Road. Um, where I asked, asked if he could um, play the track through their monitors in the control room and mic that. Yeah. So that was one of the ways that, you know, when we're in the control room, we're hearing that mix. When we're out by Brian playing, we're hearing his guitar very raw, very dry, very upfront. Um, when uh, And a little bit of leakage from his headphones. And a leakage from the headphones. When, when Ro uh, Roger's singing, Galileo's, <laughs> we're getting, you know, we cut from interior control room, full mix to... Um, the whole mix playing back over headphones and him singing very dry, um, and then even when when you know when he was on talking back to the music wasn't playing but he was talking back to everyone in the control room, um, you know I recall we always used to put a little bit of echo plate or something onto a vocal when we were recording just sure. to, just to hear in the control room. Um, so you know as as Roger is talking to everyone in the control room, that's the way that the control room is hearing it. They're hearing him with a little bit of reverb on him um, and slightly out of balance, and then we cut back into the recording area and he's bone dry, um, things like that. We wanted to really, really create, for people I think who have never been in a recording studio, just understand what that process was like back um, right. in those times of 24-track recording. Pre-digital, certainly. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The other thing we managed to do up at Abbey Road as well was we did quite a lot of recording of all the old equipment there. Because mm -hmm. um, it's Abbey Road is sort of like half commercial studio and half like a museum of, mm -hmm. of all recording in the 20th century. So they have all sort of multi-track machines and even down to the studio doors, the opening and closing of the doors and things like that for, for the for the door. So you get that, you know, those big wide doors that the, the sounds that they make so we did quite a bit of yeah, recording and those multi track recorders make a very characteristic thump yes right? yeah. yeah exactly yeah. yeah yeah but you can hear like the you know on the mcis they, they used to have the head shield that came up when you hit play and that always made a, a big thump as the capstan hit the tape and then the head shields come up mm -hmm. and, and then you know the spinning of the motors obviously and uh, all of that's <laughs> pretty authentic in the film that's great great um, Paul and Tim, talk to me a little bit about Dolby Atmos in the film and what you guys uh, were able to do with Atmos. Um, I, you know, obviously in the concert sequences, but in some of the other scenes as well. I mean, um, from an effects point of view, um, the main job, certainly through Live Aid and things like that, was as Paul and and John have explained that there was a whole lot of music and, and how they'd got about doing the music mix. What I had to do was basically have the ambience of a crowd um, that was 90,000 people that was a bed and that had to feel in the same space as the music and the voice. Um, and so my main job was really to sort of take the tracks that I had and there were many, many, many different layers and weave in and out of sort of make swells, dips and make it seem like the, the actual crowd was like a sea, it was moving. So we had basically beds in the ceiling we used every single pretty much every single speaker in the room um just to create that sort of i would say like a sea you know yeah. a gentle sea because you can't have a crowd just screaming all the time sort of through that 20 minute section because it would just become white noise so as the music died i would we would sort of use the sort of generic crowd as it were just to swell a little bit and just have pockets here and there and just so you you never felt that it was just a bed it was always just gently moving around mm -hmm. so that was that was the main job really of the crowd around that so pretty much every speaker was used for the effects yeah. and crowd yeah <laughs> then with the music because i had full access to all these individual instruments which was just a, a delight um uh, very early on in the pro in the in when I was first hired on the film, I talked to John about I, I wanted to get some um, well dyed if you will, uh, recordings of all of the music for the larger sequences through the film, as they went through the auditoriums and then into the stadiums. Um, and so what that meant that was that I wanted to not just use electronic reverbs and delays and the, the normal tools that we can use to create space, but um, re-record all of the songs played through a large speaker system in a space so we could pick up the ambient sound of that. 
Right. Unfortunately, um, we we found that um, uh, Queen was on tour last year, and uh, so in July they were playing in the O2 Arena in in London, and um, John Warhurst and and the Queen engineers uh, managed to get some time in a soundcheck moment where there was no audience in the stadium and played all of the songs full length that we needed through their touring PA at full level. Wow. And then that was mic'd by 22 mics placed around the stadium from the stage level up into the rafters looking at the very back. Um, and they were f just, they're just fabulous recordings. And so to get f closer to your question, that, that gave us, that then once we got into the final mix, I was able to utilize um, those 22 mics um, almost like a reverb return mm -hmm. uh, for different shots and perspectives around these these larger concert pieces. Um, and Dolby Atmos was invaluable at that time because I, I placed almost, I think, I think I did place 100% of them into objects within the ceiling and within the space of the, of the viewing theater to try and recreate the height and breadth of, um, of these stadiums as the shots called for it within the film. And that's how we were able to get, uh, you know, such scale to, to the, the massive shots at the back of Wembley where you see the band way off in the distance on the horizon. For those poor bastards who were, had the really yeah, cheap seats exactly. that were way back on the exactly. other side but of the You know what, that was right? one of my favorite sort of soundscapes that you created in that yeah. movie, you know, when, yeah. when the camera just yeah. is at the back of the stadium. And the, it was immense what you did there. I thought it was yeah. just so cool. That's good. We, I mean, we basically started, I started off with a, a 7.1 mix of the band. Uh, of the music, essentially, and then added in varying degrees these these mics that I just described to to, to create perspectives as we needed them. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, Brian and Roger, Brian May and Roger Taylor were were present a lot of the time while we were mixing and while we were doing the music premixes, and which initially was terrifying for me, but <laughs> <laughs> it was such a great moment to uh, to to see them happy and uh, and to work with them. They were just delightful. Um, Brian was especially very interested in in the theory of Atmos and um, how objects worked technically hmm. and how did it translate into your local theater um, and what advantages does that give us and so you know once um, I've I had to explain to him the um, all, all of the, pe the the points in the theater that you could access right. and the fact that it's full range surrounds. Um, uh, and um, he was intrigued. He was totally intrigued. Um, and it was great working with them, with them knowing that knowledge rather than not really understanding what Atmos was, but sure. telling me if they liked the mix or they didn't like the mix. Yeah. Um, well, that's one of the things about Atmos that I think most people, it's, they don't think about or talk about much at all, which is that the spec calls for full range surrounds. And that right. I, you, the, you guys use that really <laughs> powerfully in this film to, to make the audience feel like you're in Wembley. You right. Know? And, and also in conjunction with that, if, if you, you might have a wonderful sound with full range surrounds in Atmos, you've got to be very cognizant of how that's going to fold down into seven, one and five, one and home theater, mm -hmm. uh, down the road. So it's constant, um, as with any mix, really, when you mix natively in Atmos, you've got to be constantly aware of how that's going to translate into lesser formats. Um, but it was really enjoyable process and, and having, that those tools at our fingertips was delightful. Brian actually re-recorded um, the Fox logo. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that because yeah. the movie starts off with yeah. that crazy <laughs> treatment of the Fox logo to open the film. So that's actually Brian May playing it. That's Brian. Um, I'm told he used 64 guitars yeah. to create that, and yeah. um, <laughs> it was at that moment when he got completely intrigued with Atmos and wanted me to basically stop mixing. Let's describe what what do all these dots mean on the Dolby screen. Yeah. And what will they do? And how can I hear that? And what does that sound like? Um, so you guys spent a week mixing uh, the. That, sound. that was almost <laughs> the, yeah, the entire first day of the final mix was the logo. It was the logo. I think actually, over the course of the six weeks or whatever, um, took us a full two days by the time we were done, because we kept going back to it. But um, give me an idea. We should we should talk to Brian May about maybe uh, doing a Dolby Atmos logo. You should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He'd love it now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys so much for coming in today to talk to us about the just extraordinary sound work on, uh, on Bohemian Rhapsody. Now, before we go, I, you know, 
you know, uh, Tim and Paul, I know you guys have done this. You, you've done this before. You just did this last year on Baby did, Driver. Yeah. 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 So you guys are in town. Yeah. Yesterday was the Oscar nominees luncheon, which I, I understand, I'd never having been nominated for an Academy Award myself, I understand that this is actually one of the most fun parts of the process, right? So you guys all got together yesterday, all the nominees, one big lunch. Uh, who, any stories? Like, who was at your table? Well, we had a great end of that, didn't we? Yeah. We, um, we, we actually, um, we, we all went to a private sort of like drinks, not knowing who was going to be there. And it was literally the sound crew as we are, with Dennis, the producer, and Rami, Ben, Lucy, and Joe, who play sort of, you know, three or four of the main characters. Wow. So it was an amazing night. Amazing That's great. end of night. Mm. <laughs> well, congratulations again, John, uh, Nina, Paul, Tim, and John. Thank you. Uh, it's just extraordinary work on this film. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, congratulations, and, and thanks for coming in and doing, doing the show for us. This is uh, Glenn Kaiser wrapping out from Fox Studios for the Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection.